everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna be looking at a new scanner to us. This is the Creality Ferret Pro uh, 3D scanner kit. It comes with a whole pile of little goodies and things. Uh, we're gonna take a look at those. So first things first, uh, pertaining to this scanner directly, uh, and this being a jewelry channel. If you're looking for a 3D scanner that you can then take and scan your client's ring or something to remake it, uh, this is not the 3D scanner for you. So I'll see you guys in the next video. This scanner is designed to handle scanning objects that are about six inches up to about two meters or so. And I know I just completely mixed up Imperial and metric there, uh, I'm Canadian. So if you're an artist or a designer and you're trying to create a piece of jewelry by capturing something from the real world and you're going out and say scanning a, a rock or a statue or uh, some other kind of asset within that six to two meter range, um, then this is a scanner that you're definitely gonna wanna take a look at. Included with this kit is this brick here. This is the Wi-Fi 6 bridge. Uh, this is a 5,000 milliamp hour battery bank in the handle, which allows us to go out and use it wherever. It has a phone clamp, which goes onto the handle. And then on top of the clamp goes this little bendy piece and then the scanner itself. And this all gets tied together via a series of two cables. Um, when we start with this testing, we're going to be doing it in the most controlled environment possible which brings us to this photo box that we built many years ago. Uh, we originally designed it for taking product photos. It had a nice white melamine uh, kind of semi-glossed finish, but now it's changed to this special black paint called Black 3.0, which absorbs, I think it's 99.5% of visible light. It might be 99.9, .9, I can't recall. Uh, since this has been made, there is a black 4.0 and I'm sure there's a black 5.0 on the way as well. Um, but anyway, if you were to design, design something like this and you wanted to have an ultra black background where there's no visible light, uh, especially, you know, you might be able to see a little bit of it in this environment, but when you're taking a scan, it literally cannot see it. And then of course, enclosing the entire box itself is this white acrylic Thing that you can see. This is designed to be a light diffuser. Um, if I turn on the, the light bar on the top, it kind of spreads out the light. It makes it not harsh. It shields it from the windows and the sunlight and we get diff those different colors of lighting. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about that because I'm not trying to capture the full color gamut. Now the scanner can capture 24-bit color if that's of interest. In, in a photography sense, it's much more important because you don't want to have mixed white balances. Things can start to look weird. So what we're going to be scanning first of all is this resin cast Buddha statue because it's got all of these surface details. It's kind of meant to look like wood. Um, if this was actually carved, you would not have it as rough as it is. It looks very like more like bark. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. This is going to be a very interesting thing to scan. We'll get it in color and we'll get the geometry and we'll compare them between. Um, one of the tests that I want to do is put this inside the box and scan it with and without lighting because I want to see how well the scanner handles those different types of conditions. Um, and then after this test, we'll take it outside and we'll try putting it through its paces where I think it's going to be a lot harder, but we'll see. All right, so let's start the scan. And I'm going to nudge this turntable. There we are. So all I want to do is get this bottom corner over here. And then I think we're done this scan. So it looks like I have the entire thing. I'm going to go up to next. Here it looks like there was a little hole here on the top of the ear. Now this is pretty normal seeing little undercuts and things that the scanner couldn't see. Uh, the software generally is pretty smart and can handle filling those in. I'm going to choose STL format because I prefer it. Uh, we want it to be closure on because we want to actually fill in some of these holes so that it's a, uh, I believe they call it watertight. And then we go next and it looks like it's going to handle everything for us. So that filled in holes underneath. Yeah, it just kind of like patched them as best it could. It didn't get this massive hole, but that's something we can deal with in a different software. I uh, got the top of the ears. Yeah, I'm very pleased with how this has turned out. This looks awesome. Okay, so from here, we can delete it or we can rename it. Uh, export to computer, um, share to other apps. Let's do packaging the model, okay. Really warm now, which is expected, I suppose. So it's gonna save it as a zip format. 
turn on the iPad. Now that's available to AirDrop. Presumably that goes over here. Pretty big folder. Uh, then we can go open. And I'm going to open this in Nomad Sculpt. So this is phenomenal looking at this. Now, if we turn on wireframe, you can see the poly count that's going on. Uh, this looks excellent. Now to fill in this hole, specifically in Nomad, all I'm gonna do is go up to voxel, remesh. I'm going to change the mesh. So actually you can see here, uh, we've got triangles of all different sizes. When I hit remesh up here, what it's gonna do is change that into something a bit more uniform which is better for sculpting because this will give us like uneven patches. And there you go. You can see we've got nice, nice even quads now across the entire surface. And what that did on the bottom is it filled in that hole as best it could. It just kind of made some assumptions. You can see it's not perfect by any means, but again, this was not even captured information. This is made up. So this is pretty, pretty good. So we just scanned the object again without any lamp. However, I do notice that we have pretty much no uh, base around the bottom. And I believe that's because the black background combined with the black floor with the black turntable, it was so dark that it was outside the scale or outside the scope of what the camera uh, of the scanner was able to handle picking up. So we'll see how much detail retention we get. We'll bring that over onto the iPad and we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison with them and uh, we'll see how it looks. So I'm looking at it and you know what? This is really pretty much the same. If we look up here at this area, you can see they're pretty much the same uh, in terms of the shadow and the color depth, or not color depth, the, the depth of the model itself. Looking at this section here, by comparison, they are pretty much the same Looking at some of the marks on the face, uh, looking at this dimple right here, at that one, pretty much the same. This one here, yeah, you know what? I would say that this is excellent. These are basically the same. Um, let's go scan some more things. Um, I'm getting very excited now. Okay, so we're outside. I apologize, it's a little bit windy. I've tried to block my mic, but you know, if it doesn't work, sorry. Um, so we're gonna try and uh, scan this moldy old tire <laughs> that we just had kicking around the yard. Now I'm noticing something that this is going to be very challenging first and foremost. If we take a look here on the screen, you can actually see in the preview something that's happening. You, there, there, there's so much light out here that it's actually overwhelming the camera to the point where it's not able to really capture a whole lot. So I have tried doing auto and I've tried doing manual exposure and I can still see really, really clearly. So this is one, gonna be one of those big challenges that occurs when you're trying to scan something outdoors. Again, like we talked about indoors, having that controlled lighting environment is incredibly important. I feel like for a tire, you probably have the option of scanning in a garage, for example. Maybe we'll actually try that when this doesn't work because I'm pretty sure it won't. So to be clear, it's not that it can't capture anything. You can see it is doing a pretty good job. I'm trying to keep it at a really good steady distance. But one of the issues with tires specifically is all of the tread, which it, it does provide nice landmarks, but all of the tread is the same. So in other words, it's, it's going to lose tracking because it thinks that I'm in another section. It just did it. I was right here on the, on the side and you can see there, actually look, it's, it's just like automatically scanning nothing. I'm not even moving. So there are a few little quirks, definitely, that need to be worked out. So welcome to the new studio. Uh, this is uh, our brand, this is our garage. Uh, we kitted it out from basically nothing. Um, I'll show you a before and an after photo. Uh, that's a whole other video series though. If you're interested, make sure you check it out. Anyway, this is gonna be much more controlled lighting. As you can see from the ceiling alone, uh, we have these great big hexagon lights, they're 5,000K. We have almost no shadows anywhere because we have so much light bouncing around. I feel like this is going to be a really much better situation for the scanner. I'm gonna start with the tire. And I've actually got really, really good tracking so far. This is actually handling really well. Oh, it's doing the thing. It's, <laughs> here, come, come look at this. 
So there we've got some tread and I'm not moving. The tire's not moving, but it's literally just scanning, scanning something. <laughs> and it's actually built most of the tire. This is the, one of the anomalies that happens sometimes with these scans is that it will start to double track. Um, I'm not sure if I can see a great bit of detail, but there you go. Like you see, I didn't scan more than, than like this front section on the actual tire itself. And uh, this is very, very jittery. There we go. Um, and it just kind of like assumed that we were doing a tire and you can see there, the details are not wonderful. It did capture some things, but not very good. Um, I feel like if I used oculation spray, I could get a much better image. However, they do say in the marketing for the Ferret Pro that this should be able to handle black and shiny objects without the need for any kind of spray. So this is kind of working against it. Uh, you do need to worry about optimal lighting as we've already shown, having it in protected structured light is a lot better than working outdoors. So that's it for the tire, I think. Um, I, I can't say I'm super impressed with these larger ones. Now, again, these are not optimal. Um, however, as, you, as we've shown, we did bring it indoors, so we are using more structured lighting. Uh, we did not use a sub spray, but it does say that you can use it on black or shiny materials in the marketing. So we aren't going outside, so far outside the purview of what the scanner is advertised as being capable of that but let's try to take it out of uh, the context of, you know, pushing the envelope and let's go to try to scan. Let's try to scan Shannon. <laughs> Level of detail that this is able to capture and the tracking so far, just in this last like five seconds has been awesome. If I needed to capture a client's features so that I had proportion for like, say a nose ring or something, um, I only mention that because Shannon's got nose jewelry. Um, I would already have it. And the last thing I'm going to get is her hands, just because that's got uh, a fair amount of detail that I want to see how well it can capture. Just having a bit of trouble every time I tilt the scanner, trying to capture undercuts and complete the, the scan itself. As soon as I move and tilt it, it, it definitely loses traction. But I've experienced that with pretty much every scanner, so this is not unique. It just does not want to get her hair. Like, it's clearly seeing it. It just cannot seem to compute what it's looking at. So there's the scan of Shannon. Um, obviously, as I said, I was having a lot of issues with her hair. It does try to just kind of like lump them together, which you would expect. Um, it's not ideal, but I did manage to capture like part of her ear there. Her face is excellent. It does try to kind of like blend her eyeball into her eyelid, which isn't ideal, but not bad. The rest of the proportions that it captured are really good. It managed to capture the fabric like flawlessly. I don't know if it captured the exact texture of it, but it certainly captured all the folds that were going on. Now it did miss some, obviously. Um, you'd want to spend a lot more time on a, on a project like this. So those are my 3D scans so far. My, my initial impressions for the Creality Ferret Pro 3D scanner are not bad. It's, it's definitely a good way to start scanning. It gives you the freedom to move around unlike others where you're tethered in. Um, it did obviously struggle based off of these results that we're showing you that uh, it can handle indoor scanning no problem. So if you have a garage, you have some space that you can move around, perfect. I bet you it could handle doing a wheel on a car pretty well if it was on, on a rim and not a repeating set of textures like this tire that we tried, where it was just kind of like phantom scanning itself, which is weird. If you're going to be doing shiny scanning, anything that's got a, a sheen to it, anything that's glossy, a sub is a great material that everyone should have if you're doing any kind of scanning jewelry, large format, whatever. It is amazing stuff. My overall, you know, if I had to give it a, a number, a numeral rating, how would I rate this? I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it a solid six out of 10 or so. Um, it is able to handle large format, as we can see by the scan of Shannon. This is really nice. 
However, it, the software is a little bit odd and it was a, wasn't able to handle the tire very well in or outdoors. Um, now my situation might be a bit different than yours, so definitely take that into account. Ideal situation, as we saw when we scanned the Buddha statue, was phenomenally good. So in a controlled setting, this thing is going to excel like crazy. Um, I'm going to give it an extra big point because of the Wi-Fi bridge. It is Wi-Fi 6, the new standard or the newest standard is Wi-Fi 7. So it's not as fast as it could be, but it's still really good. And as compared to other scanners where we've tried uh, scanning tethered to a computer, this is exponentially more freeing. I would not want to have a big long cable dragging around while I'm trying to scan Shannon. She would be all tangled up in it. It just wouldn't be ideal. It's, it's already hard enough just trying to keep the tracking and the distance. And that's just one less thing I have to worry about. Talking about the value proposition of this whole setup in general is, is also understated as well. Um, when you look at other scanners in this same uh, size category, let's take the 3D Maker Pro Moose, for example. That's one of the newer ones that they've come out with. It can handle objects uh, approximately the same size. It's a little bit more accurate, but generally speaking, I would put them in the same weight class. Now this one, the entire kit, except for the phone, uh, is I think 449. I'll put the exact price right there. That's for the battery, this little nice tripod thing, uh, the phone stand, the bridge, all the cords, everything that you need except for the phone itself is included in this kit. The Moose is $200 more than this entire kit, which is not, not a small sum. Now 3D Maker Pro does have something like this battery grip. I think they call it the smart grip. And it does do something extra that this one doesn't. It tells you the distance that you need to be, but it, it's an extra cost. So the scanner itself, the Moose is already $200 plus more, plus the extra, which is another 260 something. I'll put the exact price right there. Uh, so uh, overall, this is a great value proposition by comparison to many of the others, and I would recommend it as like your first scanner. And one of the other little things is the battery. Um, the battery is actually charging, it's, it's, or rather it's powering, the bridge and the scanner itself. So this whole unit is, this is 5,000 milliamp hours. Um, it's still reading at 100%. It gives me the little uh, readout there. You can turn it off with two presses or turn it on with one. Um, overall, for this entire thing, I've just left it on for like, the last two or so hours and it's still reading at you know, 100%. Uh, if it was powering the phone as well, which I think it could because there's an extra USB-C here, it might be able to do that. Um, I bet you this thing could last you a solid four to six hours of scanning and that can't be understated. I feel like that's an excellent amount of time for you to you know, work around an asset and, uh, and do multiple scans that you can then combine. That's something we haven't talked about very much. Um, there's multiple ways that you can go about it and this will allow you to do that. And then of course, bringing it back to more our personal situation where we're talking about like what, what I do with this. Well, I would be scanning people more. Um, this is very travelable. As you saw in that kit, it all packs down. It has this nice padded everything. It has its own space. That is something that I could take with me to one of our conferences. Um, maybe I end up scanning somebody because they want to do a, a custom piece with me. They've got like massive lobes or uh, something going on on their face, some body jewelry, and we want to get their exact proportions so that they fit flawlessly. This would be a perfect unit for doing something like that. Being that it folds down so small, I can just throw this in my carry-on and I'm off to the races. So in conclusion, I'm going to give it that 6 out of 10 just because it didn't quite perform very well on those two very key points that they're advertising in the marketing, the black and the shiny scanning. Um, I think it could definitely use a little bit of work. Um, probably my technique could use some work. I'm definitely not mitigating the fact that, you know, my scanning setup was flawless, but we did try according to what they advertised and uh, it didn't work out so great. So it does get bumped down a little bit, but overall I still highly recommend this as a way of going out into the field, getting assets, taking it on the road to capture a sculpture or something. Um, it's going to be a very useful tool for us to have in our toolkit, and I really look forward to being able to pull it out and work on some projects.